Hi, everyone. My name is Barbara Dillon. I am the editor-in-chief of Fanbase Press. I'm honored to be here today with a wonderfully talented group of panelists to discuss how each panelist defines healthy queer representation, whether it's necessary to only tackle the positive stories and aspects of life, and much more. I'm going to go ahead and introduce each of our wonderful panelists. Uh, in no particular order, we have David M. Boer, who is a GLAAD award-winning writer who has created comics for Dark Horse, Image, IDW, and Vault, with credits including All New Firefly from Boom Studios and Dungeons and Dragons Saturday Morning Adventures for IDW. His all-ages fantasy series Canto is now in development as a feature film with Will Smith's Westbrook Studios. His LGBTQ-led Killer Queens is a 2023 Eisner Award nominee and was featured in the New York Times as a must-read in honor of Pride Month. David, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Barbara. And as we just talked about, I'm wearing a pink tux to the Eisners. So I love it. Let's love do it. it. Let's do it. <laughs> Next, we have A.C. Esguera, who is an award-winning cartoonist whose work blends fantasy and history in traditional ink and watercolor. Their debut original graphic novel, 80 Days, a queer historical romance epic about pilots in an alternate 1930s, was on Yalsa's Great Graphic Novels for Teens list and nominated for the Glad Media Awards in 2022. Recent work includes illustrating Who Was Amelia Earhart with Melanie Gilman and creating the City of Poets Public Arts comic series for the San Francisco Arts Commission. They live here in Los Angeles. AC, thank you for joining us. Thank you. We also have Josh Trujillo. He was a writer, editor, and narrative designer based in LA. He has worked with clients including Marvel, HBO, Google, Telltale Games, Netflix, and DC Comics, among many others. Trujillo is the creator of the colorful com uh, children's book, Lost Beat, uh, excuse me, Lost Beast, Found Friend, the sports comedy Dodge City, the historical romance Declaration, and the romance anthology Love Machines. His work spans different genres and audiences, including children's fiction, history, gaming, and queer issues, and he has written for various iconic characters, including Blue Beetle, Superman, Wonder Woman, and The Flash. Josh, thank you so much for being here. Oh my gosh, thank you for having me. Of course. Uh, next, we have Richard Fairgrave, born and raised in New Zealand. He began writing and publishing comics at age seven. By the time he left for America at 30, he had over 200 titles to his name. His work has ranged from children's books like Gorillas in Our Midst, My Grandpa is a Dinosaur, a personal favorite, and If I Had an Elephant, to graphic novels and ongoing comics like Ghost Ghost, Blastosaurus, and the middle grade horror series Black Sand Beach. His most recent publications include Shed from Blue Fox Comics, Haunted Hill, his memoir Octopus, and the LGBTQIA plus coming of age graphic novel for Color Heroes from Fanbase Press. Richard, thank you for being here. Where else would I be? <laughs> <laughs> Last but certainly not least, we have Tilly Bridges. Tilly and her wife Susan are a writing team with a focus on comics, screenplays, teleplays, and audio dramas. Her book, Begin Transmission, The Trans Allegories of the Matrix, tracks one person's transition journey from Thomas Anderson to Neo to Trinity. Tilly is the co-founder of Pendant Productions, an award-winning audio drama production company, as well as a writer of the 2023 Nebula Awards, the new Monster High animated series, and the Star Trek Adventures and Fallout role-playing games. Tilly, thank you for being here as well. Thanks for having me. Of course. So, uh, folks, what I would love to do is let our viewers get to know a little bit about you as individuals. So, how did you come to be a creator and what inspired you along the way? Josh, we're going to start with you this time. Oh, gosh. Um, so, you know, I've always been interested in comic books, video games, animation. Um, my grandparents would read the Sunday funnies to me, and I think that's kind of my first exposure to comics. Um, but, you know, just a lot of self-publishing, internships, and kind of good fortune, I guess, kind of got me into the industry. Um, and I've just been very lucky to do it. It's been about eight years now. Wonderful. And Tilly, what about you? I have always been a fan of comics and movies and TV and anything with a story. Going back to when I was a kid and, and the very long, overly complicated stories I would make up for my action figures. Um, so I've pretty much been a storyteller my entire life. And um having the privilege to tell stories is uh, one of the most important things in my life and it's something I will never take for granted. So I, I love every medium um, and I'm just so happy to be able to tell stories in them. AC, what about you? 
Um, I grew up writing and drawing. Um, I was like the kid drawing highlighter comics under the table, whatever class I was in. Um, and I sort of grew up like just in between like American pop culture comics movies and like manga, which was um, first um, coming to the US like really popular um, when I was a kid. And um, also like with Indian web comics um, when they were really becoming uh, popular. So I was just kind of between all these things. And I think I was really inspired to start doing comics by um, Scott McCloud's making comics and V for Vendetta and One Piece. So just all of these things, um, you know, made me feel like, yeah, like, why not use both words and image? I don't have to choose one. Absolutely. Uh, David, what about you? So I talk about this a lot, but uh, I started reading comics, the floppy, like single issue, you know, Wednesday, every Wednesday comics, uh, probably about 15 years ago when I started going to San Diego Comic-Con. Um, and I always used to, I used to describe it as coming late to comics, but I realized that that was um, wrong in two ways. It was um, like just, it, it suggests that there is some right time to come to comics and somehow I missed the boat and now I'm late and here I am finally. And that's not right. You can come to comics, you know, when you're eight, 18, 38 or 80, whatever. Um, and then also it was factually incorrect because I was thinking about comics in a, in a different way because I used to read Mad Magazine. I'm very thrilled to say that I just resubscribed to Mad as a 44 year old adult human person and I love it. Uh, and I used to read Mad when I was a kid and I used to read the Sunday funnies like Josh was talking about. I used to um, use that silly putty. I don't know, Josh, if you ever did that where you put the silly putty on it and it transfers the newsprint comic backwards. And I used to read them backwards. Um, Farside, Garfield, all that stuff. So uh, my, my entry to comics was when I was young, but then I started writing comics after I started reading com this, the single issue comics about um, 10 years ago and uh, published my first thing in 2017, which seems like it was yesterday, but it's now six years ago, which is crazy. Excellent. And, and Richard, what about you? Um, I, my, my, my father was really insistent that I had to know how to read and write before I started kindergarten because he thought that if I didn't, I'd be behind. And so I was reading and writing when I was three and I got, got really fed up with how many books were like, essentially they were trying to placate me and make me happy about a boring world. And so I started writing my own stuff. Um, I think I've always just been annoyed that there isn't stuff for me out there. And so I keep making it. And then when I was four, I did a book uh, about Donald Duck goes to a haunted house. He's meant to meet Mickey Mouse there. Mickey Mouse doesn't show up. So Donald goes in on his own finds a ghost in the attic that goes to sad and lonely and has no friends. Donald realizes that he has no friends either. So he shoots himself in the face to become a ghost so that he can stay there with the ghost and they can be friends forever. And uh, I got in a lot of trouble and um, it kind of just made me realize that like, it's quite, it's quite fun like seeing the effect that writing a story can have. Uh, and so I kind of just never stopped doing it since then. I still find it very hard to find things to read. Well, Richard, you raise a really interesting point, which is a great transition for our next question, and that is not being able to find things that you feel like are for you. Um, the next question for each of you is, prior to your involvement as a creator in the industry, do you recall your first experience in reading a comic book or comic strip that featured a queer character or storyline? And was this a, a positive, healthy experience, or was this a, a negative experience for you? Tilly, we're going to start with you this time. So when I was a kid, I didn't know that I was trans, but I absolutely never saw a trans character in any of the comics that I had ever. Uh, the first queer character I can remember seeing and that I identified with for reasons I didn't understand at the time was um, Maggie Sawyer in the Superman comics. Uh, she's a lesbian. And at the time, my uh, I was you know living at home with my parents. I, I was a kid and any mention of queer people was not allowed. It was wrong, it was bad, you know? And so it it felt like this very weird, like forbidden knowledge to be reading this comic about a perfectly normal lesbian character in a comic book. And I, I 
just like glommed onto her so hard. And I didn't know why, because I didn't know I was trans and that I was a trans lesbian. But that was the first time looking back that I ever actually saw a character that I in some way identified with uh, on, a, on a queer level. I, I mean, I, I, I was just going to say, I remember the same thing where I would, you, you have to read in secret, right, Tilly? Yeah. You have to like... I couldn't let my parents see those ones. I had to keep them hidden. Mm-hmm. No, no. And you put, I, I don't know, you hide like <laughs> romance novels on top or you, I don't know. I don't know what you, what else you read. But um, yeah, I remember hiding that stuff. And um, if I'll, I'll jump in, Barbara. Uh, I, I, it wasn't comics for me. It was this, I, I, it still sticks in my mind. It was the early 90s and it was this book of, um, it was a full book, I think, or maybe a short story that was called Am I Blue? And it's this kid who's kind of struggling with his own sexuality and everybody, every queer person on the planet um, turns blue, different, like different shades, but no, you know, everybody is outed. Everybody is outed. So um, for me, that was kind of a revelation as a young kid. It's like, oh my gosh, I can actually know and see in this story. I could see people who felt like me and thought like me. And that was that was a a wild moment for me. I don't know if it was an awakening or more of, you know, it caused a little more despair than, than I would have had, but I, I just, that, that sticks with me so much. And I hid that. I did not read that in, in outside. I hid it and read it myself. Yeah. Uh, Richard, what about you? Um, I mean, I, I just, I just remember a lot of uh, very bad gay characters um, in stories. And then, the sort of shift that started happening through the 90s of like we can start having gay characters who don't die immediately or who aren't terrible villains and um it really quickly turned into a, a, a whole different world of of representation that i found incredibly distasteful um and that made me feel like far more alienated by it like the 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 sanitized version of 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 queer representation that i was like well I guess I'm not part of that world either. Cool, good. Easy, what about you? Continue making my dirtbag stories. <laughs> <laughs> we will definitely touch more on that. <laughs> Shooting more, having yeah. Disney more Disney characters shoot themselves in the face. Oh, no. Awesome, keep going. <laughs> uh, AC, what about you? Yeah, I get what you're saying, Richard, about like uh, creating from like this profound dissatisfaction. <laughs> um, I feel like a lot of us feel that way. Uh, for me, I, I think my first encounters with queer characters were like with closeted queer characters or maybe like under the radar queer characters. And this was from like anime. This was from like the Sailor Moon English dub where Sailor Uranus and Neptune are clearly in a lesbian relationship, but we're called cousins in the American dub infamously. Um, and, you know, um, my cousin would tell me like, did you know that in Japan they're actually like together? And, you know, I was like, whoa, what do you mean? But, you know, it, it, it was, it was like that with a lot of um, the manga I was reading where it was like, you know, it was there, but it was not talked about. And that like subtext was, uh, I guess, really influential to me. Like I absorbed it and there was like lots of androgyny in anime and manga too. And so it, it wasn't, uh, you know, it's negative in the sense that uh, it wasn't like fully realized out queer characters, but it wasn't all negative either. It was like, it was exposure, right? It was exposure to um, another world that at that time I wasn't seeing anywhere else. That's that's the farthest back memory I can have. And then maybe later, a little bit later in like the web comics of the mid 2000s or so, there were more like um, characters that were like, just queer and living their lives like a, a big one was um the adventures of tj and amal by ek weaver um that was a great comic about like a gay road trip that was like oh like fully realized characters like that just happened to be gay like how nice to see and it's um yeah it's opened up a lot from there i think can i can i just jump back in for a second um uh i, I realized i sort of didn't say any good representation I actually found and I think the first book that I read that like really spoke to me about it was uh Prick Up Your Ears the uh, biography of Joe Orton and it was like the, the first time I was seeing a gay character who was or a, a gay person because he was also a real person 
um, who is like living a lifestyle that didn't adhere to all of the like the the sanitized stuff that I was talking about. Um, and so that was I think that was like very eye opening in that way of like like when you're a kid and you first see Doctor Katz and you're like oh it's okay to just be a little bit funny. You don't have to actually try to make people laugh out loud. You can wear them down. This was the oh it's okay to be like not part of either side of this thing. The best reference ever. Thank you for that, Rich. <laughs> Yes, and that, that comedy approach of just wearing them down. I'm I'm hundred percent in on that now. I've never it's heard that. Money Thank ball you, of jokes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. But Josh, what about you? Uh, you know, my answer is a lot like AC. I feel like I didn't see queer characters represented at all in the comics I was reading in like the '90s. Um, so I had to look towards like manga. So a lot of Sailor Moon, a lot of me sitting on the floor of Hot Topic, just casually reading comics instead of paying for them. Um, but Sailor Uranus and Neptune are probably the first like positive portrayal of like a queer couple I ever saw. And then I had to keep looking to kind of like, oh gosh, like Magic Users Club or even Evangelion, like not quite queer relationships, but there's kind of this like Kawaru Shinji stuff going on that like they elaborate on in the sequels. But anyway, like that's a really uh, screwed up relationship, but it was still like, I saw something of myself to see these two to character just like profess their love for one another. Um, and then on the US side, it wasn't until probably like Young Avengers, I think that I saw like an openly gay couple. And even that they were kind of like uh, withholding about those characters and their sexuality for the first few years. So like, it's just amazing how far we've come in in that regard. I think okay. it's really, okay. oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Richard. I, I just think it's really interesting how often and not just this group but like how often people will say the first thing they re related to was a lesbian character I think that there was for our generation and I know that we're all a little different in age here but like the broad spectrum of the past 30 40 years um lesbian characters were far easier for people to put into stories because they could just have them as like this woman doesn't have a partner so we'll never address it but the representation got to be this woman is sardonic and dismissive and displeased with the men around her. And we all went, yeah, yeah, that, that feels, oh, she doesn't like the, she doesn't like the straight people. We don't have a word for it, but we really relate to her pretty hard. I like this character. And what then of course they always marry them off later in the, in the shows to some boring <laughs> man they introduce. But like for the first little while, you get to have that, that person who you feel like you want to be friends with. Absolutely. I agree. And and again, Richard, that points to a great transition to our next question. And that is that queer individuals across the LGBTQIA plus spectrum have long been active in all areas of the comic book industry. However, they may not have been comfortable in either sharing this information about themselves or representing themselves and their stories and their work. Do you feel that fear has abated over time? And are there any milestone comics or creators that you can point to that really change the face of queer representation in comics? David, we'll, we'll start with you this time. I mean, this panel is is everybody that I would answer. And that's always the answer I go to because I love everyone on this panel. Um, I think it definitely uh, has abated in some ways over time. I mean, we're in such an, uh, a strange time right now where it feels like we're approaching the 2050s, but it's the 1950s. So um, I think editorially in, in, in the major publishers, they're very, very, very supportive of um, queer stories, queer uh, creators. Uh, but I still think there's resistance with marketing, promotions, the higher ups, the folks that are looking at the, the, the money side of things and saying these stories don't sell, which we're, I think, getting to the point where that's just nonsense. You can have, you know, a horror story that's a blockbuster and it just happens to have queer, you know, the, the, the parents who are trying to save. I personally am writing right now that it's, it's two dads who are trying to save, you know, their kids. It's like, it's a horror story that, you know, will feel new but also familiar but it's just like queer parents now let's just let's just tell the stories with the queer characters um and tell the stories that we want to tell there's less resistance to that um i think because there's been more success and so those doors on the marketing side and the money side are, are I, I think starting to open a little bit but i still encounter resistance i'm sure as everybody else does 
Right. And Josh, I saw you nodding. You, you've also had experience both with the uh, mainstream larger publishers as well as your own independent self-published work. Has this been your experience well? And, and are there any creators or comics that you would point to as, as milestone moments? Um, yeah, I mean, like, you know, we have James Tynan writing Batman, you know, like we have like the best-selling creator is openly queer. And I think that's that's, that's a big milestone. But then on the other side, you have books like like Heartstopper that like little old ladies can't get enough of, you know? I mean, like we're kind of growing the audience on both sides, but obviously there's a lot more work to be done in terms of like getting our books to parts of the country, to audiences that want them, but maybe bookstores or libraries are a little with, uh, withholding or afraid to purchase that work. So like David said, it's like, we're we're approaching the, what, the 2050s and we're in the 1950s. So we've, we've made some big gains, but there's still some huge obstacles kind of going Every, forward. Yeah, and libraries, everybody can speak to this. Libraries, they desperately want to want to um, lend all of all of the stuff that we do, but it's these folks outside who are banning them and stopping these things. So it's, it's the gatekeepers are far beyond the people that we can, like we interact with, we reach out to. It's these people who will not you know, engage with us. And that's the big challenge I think going forward is to engage the, <laughs> as Josh says, the little, old, the church going ladies who love Heartstopper. We need them to get into these, you know, city council meetings and be like, we need more of this. So. Agree, hard agree. Uh, AC, what about you? Yeah, I agree with uh, what y'all are saying where, um, you know, in, in some ways it, it there is less fear. I mean, um, coming from like indie and self-published scene, like everybody I know is queer <laughs> in some some way or another. Um, I think the trouble comes when um, these independent queer creators want to, you know, break out and um, get more like mainstream success. Not all of them do, which is awesome, but the, you know, the ones who do will run into trouble because as uh, David was mentioning, there are a lot of still um, risk averse publishers um, who, you know, don't really want to take a chance on queer storylines unless it has like proven success, like it's a certain type of queer story. Like, you know, um, you know, as we're talking about like Heartstopper is a phenomenon, right? And it's very popular and opened the doors for a lot of, um, you know, gay stories that are in the same sort of genre. Uh, but as far as like outside of that, where like the characters are queer, are, but are in very different situations, it's still not, as I think easy to get that variety of stories out there like and um yeah and the current political climate is certainly not helping um so I think the fears have abated in some ways but they have been replaced by different capitalistic fears 100 percent yeah Richard what about you I mean, I think it's the we win with a thousand cuts approach. Like, I, I don't think there are big watershed moments that have made everything suddenly turn around or even, you know, we can look back and say, oh, that one was significant. Um, but I don't think we can ever say this is the this is the book that's going to solve it all um, because we're not an episode of television. But I think that like where it's where it's becoming a problem is is the yes, there are still companies who are policing us. Yes, there are still um people who are going to fight back against us. But there's also like, like AC said, when Heartstoppers happens and you get this thing, everyone, everyone looks at it and goes, oh, that's the kind of queer book that is, that's the one that's gonna do. That's how you package queer content to make it sell. I'll go do that then. And then you get this, this new language developing where everyone is doing the same thing in it, you know, because, because we're so used to fighting for anything that when one thing gets through and there's this constant duality to it of like am i packaging my book in the right way to get in and then do the do the the shit that i want to do or am i finding the way that i can stop being on the outside by doing the kind of like have, am i getting into the code of what the right type of book is because i think all of us are we all like just by the background radiation of our lives get told that we are wrong for existing like on some level we we are constantly told that even if we have the most accepting friends and family there is still the larger political climate and we get tired and so when we see this magic code appear we go oh 
I'm allowed to be here if I do it like that one there. And and that is really understandable and also really disheartening because it, it it's it's always we as independent creators have this freedom to do whatever we want. And when you see that people within that sphere are saying, let's play it safe like Disney would. Um, it, it, I think that's the kind of that that's the, that's always like the tipping point for me of where I'm just like, I give up. I, I just give up. And Tilly, what about you? I think what I would say from my perspective is that not all queerness is treated equally by publishers because um, my wife and I have had very, very tough times trying to get any explicitly trans stories told. And I don't mean like explicit in adult content, but I just mean like this is a trans story about a trans person. And we get told by editors that they want them. And then we pitch them and they say, no, not like that. Make it exactly like this other one that exists. Or uh, we find editors who love our pitches, but we can never get them past the executives. They always shoot them down. And I think there's a, a big fear involved with that, that they think cishet people can't relate to trans stories, which is not true because trans stories are just human stories. But it's it's a really tough slog. I know um, I know other trans creators who've been told that their project will get picked up if they just change their main character from trans to cis. I know uh, publishers and production companies that have said, well, we have a trans story we aren't picking up anymore, as if there can only be one when how many stories are there out there about cis people, right? So it's it's been a very frustrating thing. And, and the indie scene is great and we could do things, you know, uh, independently that way, but we're trying to get them through publishers to get them into the stores where the people who need them will have a higher chance of seeing them. Because like um, when you're asking about really good representation, um, I think it was last year, uh, Galaxy the Prettiest Star came out by Je Jedzia Axelrod and Jess Taylor from DC. And it's a full graphic novel from DC about a trans woman main character. And I had never seen that before in my life from a major publisher. And as a kid, that would have changed my life. And you want to give that to the, to the kids out there, to the other readers out there who need those things. And you need a publisher to do that, to get it into stores. And so we keep trying to get past you know, the uh, the largely cishet gatekeepers, and it's a very frustrating process. Are the creators of Galaxy uh, trans as well? Jedzia Axelrod is, yes, the writer. Excellent, okay. Yeah. It's great. I can't wait to read it. I haven't read it yet. It's so good. Well, today we're talking not just about queer representation in comics, but taking the conversation further and discussing what healthy representation looks like. Uh, so why are we adding this qualifier? Uh, what is healthy versus unhealthy representation, um, especially when it comes to comics? AC, we're going to start with you. Yeah, um, this is the meat of the question, right? This healthy um, qualifier. But you know, um, and I, I said this before when we talked about this at um, QCon in LA. But um, I, I love that you know it is healthy, not good or bad representation, right? Because I like that you know health um, positions uh, queer comics as something that's alive and growing and changing um, constantly, and you know something that um, you know has health. Like it, you can talk about like the conditions that can keep queer comics healthy. And um, certainly I think part of it is what we've been sort of talking about here where it's healthy to have a great variety and many <laughs> of different kinds of um, queer stories. It's, you know, um, no, no good or bad, no, like no binaries, right? Like that's totally not the point. Um, I think that, yeah, the, the idea is to allow more and more creators to like tell stories from their unique perspectives. And, you know, as Tilly was saying, like, you know, prove to um, the average reader that, you know, queer and trans and um, non-binary stories are human stories and we can expand the idea of what the universal quote unquote story is um, just by sharing our perspectives and, you know, the the influences that shaped us that come out through our stories. 
Richard, I know you've touched on this earlier in our conversation. We've talked about this a lot offline as well, but um, this has been very important to you in terms of, of representing not necessarily just positive queer stories. Can you tell us more about uh, about what your thoughts are on this? Um, I, I mean, I think I just kind of want to echo what AC said. Like, this is about getting a, a, a the, the more of us who are doing it, the more varied the stories are going to become. Um, like I, I said earlier, like, the kind of like the kind of queer representation that we currently have the stuff that makes it into the mainstream if i had seen that as a kid would have made me horrified because i i, I don't and i don't engage or relate to any part of it um you know the the let's have brunch version of gay um and i feel like it's so important for it to be there but it's so important for us to like continue fighting for it and i think that like, like what Tilly was saying, that it's really hard to get this stuff into the mainstream. And then every now and again, you see, like, like, I don't know if any of you watch Strawberry Shortcake. Um, but, like, Strawberry Shortcake had a trans character appear on it and say repeatedly that they were trans. Um, and that's enormous in terms of, like, like just a, a thing that you would not think you would have ever seen happen in your lifetime. Um, and it got to happen because they were like, well, we want to have a trans character, um, and the only way they could package it was to have her be an imitation of Laverne Cox. And so she repeatedly says, as a trans Barry, as a trans Barry, in the way that Laverne Cox always starts by saying, as a trans actress, when answering questions. Um, but it's still, like, it's still, it's still got through, it's still in there. Um, so I, like, I, I don't, I'm just kind of trying to preface this by saying, like, I don't want to be saying that the stuff we have is bad. I'm just saying there needs to be so much more of it because, like I said before, we've all been made to feel like we shouldn't exist um, by the you know bad people. Uh, but when we form a new treehouse that we get to play in, if we then enforce rules of what kind of people get to be in that treehouse, it becomes just a new way of excluding. Uh, and and we need to just, you know, build a thousand tree houses. We need to have connect them with bridges yes. and it becomes exactly. I, want, I, want, I, I don't know if you've Ewok ever Village seen there was a cartoon about these characters called Ewoks. Um that it was it's very good. Uh <laughs> we just have the the Ewok village of of queer togetherness. Please. I just want Thank gay you. Ewoks. Is that too much to ask? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, David, we'll go to you next. Oh gosh, well, um, what is there to add to these wonderful responses? Um, I thought for a long time that healthy representation was going beyond. Uh, Richard, I think it's funny that you said the uh, the, the brunch version of gay because I, I don't really identify in, in that category either. Um, but just uh, telling stories that, that put queer uh, characters into just like not heteronormative but like uh circumstances that aren't about them necessarily being queer it's it's telling stories it's they're, they're a superhero who happens to be queer but they're like superman they're doing superman stuff um the horror series that i was talking about putting making the parents just just gay parents who are doing the same things that um straight cis, cis parents would do uh to try to save their kids against the boogeyman something like that um but you know the way things are going, I kind of have changed my perspective a little bit. I still want all of. I think those stories are really important. Those tree houses are really important. But also, we still need those the coming out stories. We still need the bullying stories. We need we we need to show everybody that there's so many facets to um, being part of the queer community that they people just outside of the community just don't realize that we need all of these stories. So whatever stories you know anybody listening whatever stories that you want to tell about your own experience or taking your experience into a fictional setting do it we need the story regardless of what it is if you want to write a story about brunch and the chaos that ensues do it because we need that part of it too so yeah. i am I, I think healthy representation is all the all the stories all the tree houses can i just you mentioned bullying stories and i think that's really important that's something that is getting lost right now because of the emphasis on being queer is a positive, wonderful experience, let's all buy rainbow flags and give money to a corporation again. Like, 
we have we have really lost the stories that are like here's a story about a young queer kid who's fucking suffering because of it this is a story about them having a terrible time because there are a lot of people out there who are having a terrible time who if they only see that all the other queers get to have fun they're going to be like oh well where's my like where is the representation something's wrong with me something's yeah. wrong with me yeah, Not like they, everybody else. Yeah, these these bad people must have seen something specific in me that means it's okay for me to be being bullied for it. And I I know that like we all got tired of the the old thing of oh you have a gay character how have you decided how to kill them yet? But like there's a there's a there's an in between on this where like where that those stories need to stop being uh, fought against, which is something I'm seeing a lot lately. Yeah, Josh, what about you? Yeah, these are all great. I agree 100%. I feel like better representation is always more representation, right? In terms of like the diversity of kinds of stories we tell, whether it be sci-fi or romance or something more adult or something for all ages. Um, I mean, I think that's kind of the goal. And also like to tell stories about more nuanced gay characters. We don't necessarily have to cling to maybe the shiny, happy, pure love gay couple that like Heartstopper creates. You know, I want to see more queer villains. I want to see more anti-heroes. I want to see, I want to see messy gays because that kind of reflects the reality we live in. I can take you to some places, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of stories there. Uh, Tilly, what about you? Yeah, I think we need all kinds of stories like everyone's been saying. You know, we need the the stories about the difficulties, but we also need stories about joy finding joy, especially like for trans people, you need to know that happiness is possible after transition. You need to see that to believe that you can have it too. But you can't just paint it like it's all happy rosy, right? There's there's difficulties that we encounter. I think I think the key thing that I would say about all of it is just that the stories that are explicitly about a queer experience need to be told by queer people. Because when you get the, like cishet people telling those stories, that's why we end up with trans women always being victims of violence or the butt of joke or sex offenders when it's it's horrible. So I like, you know, like, like David was saying, we need queer parents, right? Anybody can put queer parents in your story. If there's going to be a set of parents in your story, make them queer. It's totally fine. But if you're writing about what it's like to be a queer parent, that's a story only a queer person should be telling. So it's it's about not appropriating our stories, uh, which is something that specifically happens to trans people a lot. So, um, you know, put us in your stories. Uh, we can be anywhere. We can be anything. But our stories should be ours to tell. Can I, can I just tell a very quick anecdote that fits exactly into why we should be telling this, these queer stories, everybody on the panel? I wrote a um, series called Specs uh, for Boom, and it was it's set in 1987, and it's about two high school best friends. Uh, one is in the closet, who hasn't come out yet. He's in love with his best friend, um, and they end up getting a pair of magic glasses that Grant wishes, and his one wish is that his friend would love him back, but he does. he really spends the whole series not making that wish and everything goes awry and it becomes like supernatural horror. But I get the question all the time, is, is this, is that story autobiographical? As in, was I in love with my best friend in high school? And I tell people it was not, I was not in love with my best friend, but it was because I could pour my own feelings of a, as a young gay person into this character even though I wasn't in the particular circumstance, that may, I think, made it feel so authentic that people who are, you know, not in the queer community were coming to me and like, oh, this clearly must be about your life, right? I was like, no, but it's about my fear, like my emotions. And that's why, as Tilly said, that's why we need to be the ones telling these stories because there's such an authenticity there that uh, we all can bring to characters, even in other circumstances, that just, I think, will shine through even if people who are reading it don't understand that's what's happening. And that's kind of the best, the best way to go to do it, I think. Yeah, especially because like we because of the point we're at right now, that is very true. And I think everyone comes with this really bad faith argument to push back against it of like, oh, so we're not allowed to write anything if we're not part of the group. Like you, you, you are, but like just calm down. You're not trying to anyway. And like, yeah, we we get to write straight characters, we get to write cis head characters all we want because you know what we are exposed to them every day constantly we absolutely understand their experience because it's everywhere and like 
there will be like hey hey cis het people who are complaining if you just if you just let this happen you will get to write all your gay characters later we promise because when we reach the tipping point where it's completely normalized to see it then you'll get to do it too but until then sit down well said richard um because we have this platform right now and because you as creators do such an amazing job in not only bringing these stories to life which is a huge heavy lift in and of itself but in having such an amazing positive impact with these healthy representations of queer characters i just want to take a minute for each of you to share uh, either a character or a project that you have done in representing health queer representation if you want to offer the the elevator pitch for folks to check out what you're working on i'd love to start there Tilly, why don't we start with you um i think the thing i would point to the most is my new book begin transmission the trans allegories of the matrix um it is just about how very very intrinsically trans the entire uh franchise is down to its core it is about the trans experience it is about what we go through it is about what cis people need to do to be real allies what real allyship looks like it's about the way society puts all of us in boxes and lays expectations on us that uh, none of us deserve and you can all we can all break out of that and become whoever we want to be and whoever we truly are so um i encourage you all to check it out i think it may teach you some things richard what about you um i feel like i'm obligated to say four color heroes because you're here um my my latest book which is about two 15 year old boys who fall in love through comic books um, it is a very, I'd say a very subtle coming out story because it's about the complicated nature of not even having the language to to realize that you are gay, but to realize that you are gay and in love with this person uh, and like the, the 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 use of comics to bring it bring that all together. Um, it's probably my most family friendly approach that I've ever taken as I'm sitting here raving about being a big dirtbag. Um, but the yes, I'll say that I have obligation and I'll say the other end of the spectrum for me is, uh, Haunted Hill, my story about a big sloppy 35-year-old lesbian problematizing her way through Hollywood, um, calling out everyone else on their shit to the level where she never has to be self-reflexive. Um, and so I, I get I get to do both. David, what about you? Um, I realized that I'm doing a series of um, three horror stories. All of them uh, feature... Uh, queer relationships is the core story relationship, which I think is really fascinating. I think I'm going to do that forever. No matter what I do, I'm just going to put a, a queer relationship in there. Um, but I think I'll go back to Specs. Uh, it's about two 17-year-old boys, a um, little bit older than, than Richard's, uh, Richard's characters, but uh, they are exploring the one is uh, it's in, the, in the closet, sort of just learning his identity. And this, you know, this horror, this turns to a sort of a horror story about these consequences of wishes and that sort of thing. Um, but it's also about his uh, fear of coming out to his best friend, which ultimately, I, I, I like to think that I treated the, the, that coming out process to somebody he cared about so much in a way that would, that, that surprises you. And it felt, it feels very um, satisfying, but not in the, sort of Hollywood, again, Disney, sort of, oh, everything's going to be great and happily ever after, that sort of thing. But it felt very uh, like it's something that would happen uh, in 1987 in, you know, a small town high school. So I, that's Specs from Boom. And Josh? Um, yeah, my next book is called Washington's Gay General. It's a nonfiction queer graphic novel. It's about... Um, this Prussian general, Baron von Steuben, who's kind of this outlandish, larger-than-life character, and how he kind of taught the American revolutionaries how to be an army. He's one of like a, these major military figures, but his queer identity has kind of never been explored. So um, me and Levi Hastings kind of did some digging and saw what we could find out about him, his life, and also all these other kind of queer luminaries of that era. Excellent. And AC? Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, I'm going to plug, I have it here this time, 80 days, um, my uh, fantasy, um, quasi-historical epic, it's got, like, pilots and romance and rebellion and, like, an alternate 1930s 
Um, I like to call it like the really elevator pitch is like it's Gaijin Casablanca. It's just got all the things I love. It's got noir, it's got androgyny, um, things from anime, like slow burn romance between um, gay men and like just like really long character arcs. Um, yeah, and it came out with Arkea in 2021. And uh, yeah, I hope people check it out. Excellent. And in addition to promoting your own work, we always like uh, here at Fanbase Press to promote and shout out other creators to raise up their voices as well. Um, so is there another creator or project that you would like to shout out as a, a great representation of the, the healthy queer representation that we're talking about today? AC, we'll start with you again this time. Um, I'm just going to shout out Maya Kobabe's uh, Gender Queer. Um, yeah, because uh, when I was reading it, uh, I, I was reading it back when um, it was still like on Tumblr and, you know, I, it was honestly like, wow, this is, this puts into words so many like non-binary feelings I've always had, but had no idea how to identify. And, you know, it's, it's done that for a lot of people by this point, but it's worth um, mentioning again, it is, you know, um, one of the most banned books in the country right now. and um because of that fear <laughs> of um queerness reaching the people that um might need to see it the most but um yeah i just got to plug that one yeah so what about you any recommendations oh gosh um top of my head i always have to plug cena grace's work my good friend um his books rockstar and soft boy kind of explore platonic gay friendships in a way that's kind of underexplored in 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 comics or in media in general you know it's a lot of like in will they or won't they usually that red white and royal blue um but this is just about two friends and just hanging out and kind of living that that east side life Billy, any recommendations i'm just going to point back to galaxy the prettiest star by uh jedzia axelrod and jess taylor from dc it is a uh, truly excellent uh trans rep definitely give it a read and David? I'm totally going to cop out here because I'm going to say all of the books from the panelists. Uh, Richard's Four Color Heroes, which is a wonderful qu quasi coming, well, it's a coming of age story, but quasi coming out as he, as he likes to say. Um, and Tilly's book that just came out, Begin Transmission, which is uh, just, fan uh, just a fantastic exploration of, uh, I think Tilly's well, it's Tilly's personal experience, but you, f you feel close to Tilly when you experience it. So, um, and, and of course, Josh has told me a lot about that. Washington's Gay General, which I think is fantastic. And AC, can you hold your book up, spine, f spine forward to the camera, spine forward? Look at that. That, I, mm. I am in, I'm 100% in on that beautiful, wonderful tome of a book. So I can't wait to read it. That, that is a book that I look forward to re regretting carrying around at Comic-Con. <laughs> I, that, that, I will, that, I'll I will carry buy it like a sandwich, a sandwich <laughs> board, AC, a sandwich board. You're going to need a box that's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> and Richard, any recommendations from you? Um, anything by Anas Abdullak? Um, I really hope I'm pronouncing his last name right because I've only ever seen it written down. Uh, he did, he's, his current thing is coming out soon called Kill My Boyfriend. Uh, he did uh, uh, Etheris through, I want to say Source Point. Um, it was his Mad book, Cave, I think. Mad Cave? Okay. Um, was yeah, it? I, I, I can't remember, but it, it rules. Um, his book Objects in the Mirror is like a phenomenal, like poetic breakup piece um of surrealist comic mastery and his book eleutheromania which i think is free on his website which i don't have in front of me i'm sorry but look him up um a n a s a b d u l h a k i may have spelt that wrong but just a, like one of the most talented people that i've gotten to know in the past couple of years well before we sign off 
I just want to say a huge thank you to all of you for participating, for sharing, again, your amazingly talented voices with readers everywhere, for doing the heavy lift that you are in bringing these healthy representations to life on the page. Um, and I want to ensure that everyone can find you online when you're not uh, doing panels like this one. Um, if they are watching this no matter any time of year, what is the best way to find you, whether it's a website or social media? Uh, AC, we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, you can find me at Blue Lude Bar on that's uh, B L U E L U D E B A R. Um, and it's always that on Twitter, on Tumblr, on Instagram. Um, my website is bluelutebar.com. My Patreon is patreon.com slash bluelutebar. So um, whichever one of those social medias has not toppled over by the time this uh, screens, <laughs> uh, yeah, look me up there. <laughs> and Richard, what about you? Uh, I'm I'm Richard Fairgray, basically everywhere. Um, I, I will I will I will remain on Twitter as long as it doesn't become, as long as it doesn't fall down. Because I think shitting in someone's backyard who hates you is always a worthwhile activity. Um, and RichardFairgray.com, if you want to read about two and a half thousand pages of free stuff by me at this point. Yeah, that's everything. Amazing, uh, David. So I'm on all of the many many continuing to proliferate social medias twitter as long as i richard you say twitter and i just picture the um the scene with our text and a trailer from every ending story in the swamp of sadness and we're just like we're all the horse and we're just trying to get pulled out of the muck um i'm on uh, twitter at david boer instagram at david m boer uh i'm now on threads this is an exclusive club called Everybody um, at David Ember and then um, uh, Blue Sky, which has been a fascinating experience. And that one is at David Boer, because why not confuse everyone as you're trying to create a public persona, right? David, what you really want to do is set up an Instagram account for Richard Fairgray, forget the password and have to set up a new one for Richard Fairgray author, then get really dedicated to Instagram for about two years and then just randomly abandon it. That's been my approach. <laughs> Um, I'm going to do a website, richardfairgray2.com, and I'm just going to borrow 1,000 of your free pages and put them there. Go for it. I will send you glossy JPEGs. <laughs> Great. Oh, uh, Josh, what about you? Sure. Um, you can find me online at Lost His Keys Man. I lost my keys, man. Um, and I'm on pretty much every social media platform. So, you know, find me. And last but certainly not least, Tilly, what about you? I'm on most social media at Tilly Bridges. Uh, Instagram is at heck yeah, Tilly Bridges, because I also like to confuse people and somebody took my name before I got there. And um, if you're interested in uh, the work that my wife and I have written together, you can find a list of our credits and links to all of our work at birdguest.com. And if you are interested in my writing on the trans experience, I've been writing essays about it for several years now. There's over a hundred of them. They're all free and you can find them at tillystranstuesdays.com. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you all again. I so appreciate your time and your expertise. Uh, again, this has been Fanbase Press. I'm Barbara Dillon. I hope that you'll check out more panels like this one, more interviews, reviews, podcasts, and of course, our Eisner Award nominated and award winning comics and graphic novels, all at fanbasepress.com. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.